Hello, I hope this finds all of you well. I am taking a few minutes today to have a conversation with Dr. Zia Ahmed, whom I will introduce in a minute. Uh, Dr. Zia Ahmed is a good friend of mine and also a professor of literature at Emerson College um, in Multan, Pakistan. And also now, as I understand it, he is the acting principal of the college. And Dr. Zia, and I'm going to bring him on the screen as I welcome Dr. Zia. And let me introduce you. So we have you all been, uh, worked together uh, here in the United States where he came and conducted some research. Yeah. And we have collaborated so many times. So I would like to just briefly um, I thought we should have a conversation since both our institutions went into the lockdown. So uh, I thought we should have a conversation about it. So let's hear it from Dr. Zia. Uh, please share your experience with us so that, uh, you know, we can let the world know how people at two ends of the globe are coping with the same problem. Uh, yes, uh, Dr. Raja, thank you very much for having me online. Oh, you're uh, welcome. It was definitely a very great experience to work with you in USA. But even greater is the experience now, right now, that we are making, sitting in two different parts of the world, uh, you in USA and I in Pakistan, but having the same kind of activities and uh, the related issues with that, that we have been doing. Uh, I have been already practicing these kind of things in uh, Pakistan for my different classes. Uh, but you know, uh, these days, it is posing a little bit of problem in Pakistan. One is the internet connectivity issue most of the time. And secondly, our students, when they are out of institutions, they think they are on vacation. So they won't like to come to the you know, academic side. They take a type of burden. But still, uh, this online teaching has proved a very good source for me, especially to remain in contact with my students and to keep them teaching. I have found it quite useful. Uh, because I see that when we are not in contact with these students directly in the classroom, it's very, very good to uh, go online and give them certain notes, teach them certain text, and uh, in that way, get from them some feedback as well. And once I started it, uh, Dr. Raja, I found that my students are keenly interested in that. And they have sent me lots of, you know, appreciative comments along with their, uh, their assignments as well. And uh, it's, it has been going on very well. And when people saw me doing all that, no, lots of other people are also trying to do the same thing. And even HED uh, sent a letter to me that uh, this type of classes should be extended uh, for almost all the college. And now all the college is online teaching the classes, uh, two different modes. So well, it's a very good experience. Well, that's uh, great. And you know, I follow your channel on um, YouTube as well, and you have so much good materials for your students. And I will post a link to Dr. Zia's channel in the description below. Please do subscribe to it. Uh, but what I also noticed was that uh, uh, even here, we had to keep in mind the digital divide because one part of the discussion was, we don't know where our students have scattered to and will they have internet access, reliable access, uh, you know, so we had to ask our students, okay, how many of you can access, uh, uh, you know, the lectures and everything else online. And thankfully, our university was also deeply proactive because our library made sure that they had laptops that students could borrow, right? And uh, they also made sure to create certain safe spaces where if the students don't have any other place to go to for free internet, they could go to those spaces. But I think institutions at both levels uh, had to scramble to do that. And But I was delighted to watch your lectures and your progress because I saw that you were doing it for your master's students as well as for your undergraduates. And I think that's deeply commendable. Now, what I would like uh, to also ask is, is, I mean, I'm pretty sure we both agree that online teaching can absolutely not replace the face-to-face -face yeah. teaching. But I think in this pandemic, what we have learned is that knowing these resources, um, or these modes of delivering 
education is important for us as professors. So would you say that you have been able to convince your colleagues to get more involved and use these technologies? Has anyone reached out to you to learn it and then deliver their own courses using these technologies? Uh, yes, Dr. Raja, uh, in the beginning, it was a little bit difficult because students were not aware of all that. When, for example, I asked them that I will be online at such and such time, they would uh, come online, but the class, for example, if it is consisting of 50 students, there would be only 30. And 20 of them would say, okay, we don't have the internet, we don't have the laptop. But I taught them that certain applications are there uh, through which you can have a good speed of internet and then you can have uh, my access as well. Then, you know, YouTube is a very good source that not only after being online, it, it keeps uh, as a record, these lectures are there. So the people followed on that. And I made a point to publicize it as well. So that is why mostly the link was given on Facebook as well. When my colleagues saw that, no, they first of all reacted, okay, it's not possible. Uh, that's right to say, as you said, that face-to-face -face teaching, I mean, uh, someone who is standing before the class and the students are before his eyes. That's really very fascinating experience. But well, when some kind of situation is there, when uh, it's not possible, classroom teaching is not possible. At that time, the teachers must convince themselves that this is the only mode through which they can remain in contact with their students. Otherwise, they will be in the dark and the teacher will be resting at home doing nothing actually. So I found it a very good way and many of my colleagues, for example, two things I would like to tell you people here. One thing is that that my colleagues uh, first uh, were not ready to appreciate me, but later on they said, yes, this is very good. And if a principal of the college can do so, then the other people should follow the lead. And then some of the students who were not my student even uh, from India, for example, or from other countries, they sent me requests that I should record this video. I should do this thing or teach them about research, about writing of a literature review. So in that way, I felt that people want this. There is, there is a need for this kind of thing. Of course, we cannot replace a face to face classroom, but this is a type of supplementary teaching. And that I think it should happen in the same way as student accesses Google, uh, goes to various sources on internet. It's the similar type of source. And here also, uh, cyberly speaking or in a virtual space teacher is available and I have given an opportunity to my students also that they later on can send me different uh, questions about the lecture where they couldn't understand so I explain the answers to this question to them and then they respond response is very much necessary just giving them the lecture is not complete if you ask them that some kind of assignment is required they would come up with that and they would show their understanding of that so uh, in Pakistan I have done so and I think this thing is all over the world possible, though we have certain difficulties uh, as uh, as the internet speed. But HEC has come forward now. They are saying that they will be uh, selling student-friendly packages to, to the students of Paflang areas, and they are increasing the speed as well. Pakistan right now is well on this uh, procedure and process. Uh, like uh, some TV channels have been established for this purpose. And uh, internet is quite, you know, very free. Uh, like in 88 rupee in Pakistan, I think it's just a uh, half dollar. I think uh, one can buy for uh, seven days, eight uh, gigabits of the internet connection. It's so much easier, so much cheaper. So in, in that, it's flourishing day by day. And I'm listening from uh, Namal University, for example, you are aware of that. And listening from Punjab University as well. And FAST and the NUST, all these people have arranged online classes. Uh, through Google Room, for example, or through other sources. So everyone is doing that. So this is a type of culture, Dr. Raja, we, we need to adjust with. Our students need to adjust with. And our faculty also needs to adjust with that at least maybe 25%, 30%, or 50% classes are to be held through these means. OK, uh, so I had uh, another question. Uh, uh, so as far as, uh, let's say, what kind of in institutional infrastructure is in place to conduct these kind of classes? Is it right now just the professors coming up with their ways of doing these things, or is there, uh, you know, an, an institutional infrastructure to give them, you know, different uh, technologies or guidance? Or, for example, in our case, uh, people were massively using Zoom. Yeah. which was provided by the university. I didn't use it because I had StreamYard, so I wasn't going to go deliver my lectures on Zoom. But 
then there were training sessions provided and backup support or anything else. So did you have those resources or did you have to scramble on your own or how did you manage that? Well, I am uh, at a university level, I am attached with the uh, BZU and then uh, with Namal University. Namal, for example, has established uh, LMS, that is Learning Management System. That is the platform where teachers can uh, place their lectures, which they have recorded, or they can place the links to their lectures. And then they can ask for the assignment as well. Student can place their assignment in that way. And there the marks can also be awarded. So this type of platform has been provided by the universities. Uh, BZU, for example, had started this similar LMS in 2012 and onward for three years it ran and then it collapsed. But now they are re-enlivening the same system. It is also based on online system and the students send their assignments, teachers give their lectures and occasional talk of the teacher also takes place with the students. Uh, Zoom is also being used by some universities, for example, uh, in, in, uh, in Multan, uh, there is a private institution, ISP, Institute of Southern Punjab, this is a university, uh, having the MPhil classes as well. They are also using the similar platforms uh, with different names they are actually using. And the teachers send them recorded lectures. Then the teacher sits till the time, uh, sits before his computer, till the time the lecture is uh, watched by the students and ultimately discussion takes place. So this type of thing is being managed by the students. Uh, at college level, a little bit difficulties there because, you know, a lot of bureaucratic setup is there. All these people, uh, you know, they have asked us actually to go on individual level instead of providing an institutional type of uh, platform for this purpose. Universities, however, are doing in Pakistan in, in the same way. So like I must clarify for uh, our uh, US viewers that uh, the educational system in Pakistan is kind of tiered. So there are liberal arts colleges and then universities. Universities are mostly federally funded. And then colleges comparatively do not have as many resources as the universities, but they only offer bachelor's degrees and sometimes master's and MPhil degrees. And your college falls into that category as being a college and not a university. So uh, great. So anything else that um, you would like to share with, you know, before I uh, share with you, both I, have, for people I have a question. My uh, channel, way. any message? Uh, I have a question like that, that, that when you are doing these things for Pakistani people, definitely these things will be available to your US students as well. Oh, absolutely. Uh, uh, what, what do they think when they are out of campus and uh, they are restricting themselves to this type of teaching? What is their response actually? This thing I want to know for the benefit of my students so that we can tell them that all over the world these things are happening and students are doing this. So what is the response of the students in US? Well, it, it varies depending on what their major is and whether they are juniors, seniors. Uh, so for example, my wife has been teaching four classes online, which is huge work for her. And uh, she's been... Um, using Canvas, using recorded lectures, responding to their assignments. I only have two courses, so that makes my job easier. But by and large, our students have had the same kind of problems, you know, dislocation, leaving the campus, moving in with their parents, or, you know, staying with friends. Some of them who are in remote areas have digital problems. We have to accommodate for that. But one thing that I absolutely love about our students is uh, that they all, majority of them, participate, ask good questions, right? And they're kind and generous and respectful and critical thinkers at the same time. And I love that about my students. And my wife has had the same kind of experience too. Uh, we have also ma made sure to in, to let them know that we understand these are unusual circumstances so that we will accommodate problems that they might have. So our approach is also not very literalist about this must be done, this must be done. So uh, I promised my students in my first online class when we went online that my purpose from now till the end of the semester was to see them through, to make sure that they don't fail 
or they don't lose sight of their course because of this disruption. So that's how I created my lectures and that's how I covered my coursework. But by and large, I would say it's just a question of scale. Other than that, students in Pakistan or in United States have had to deal with the same kind of struggles, you know, technology, um, you know, not being on campus because being on campus itself can be a stimulating thing. So how do you have the same kind of motivation when you're sitting at home, right? And have nothing else to do. So I guess I would say the same kind of issues yeah. that, but I would absolutely say that I've been impressed with the way my students have handled this, uh, you know, this pandemic and the work that was given to them. Uh, Dr. Raja, when I uh, talk to my students that uh, Dr. Raja has, uh, uh, you know, uh, invited me to have a joint session, and, you know, they were very excited. They said that, uh, uh, please do this and let us listen and watch how you people are talking. And uh, someone suggested me the topic as well, uh, that some kind of scholarly discussion should take place uh, between both of you on any topic. I think somewhere we commented on this, uh, this, this type of teaching, uh, where you possibly said on Facebook that uh, a face-to-face -face cannot be replaced with online. Uh, somebody copied all that and said, this is the type of uh, discussion we want. So, uh, so I would also suggest sometime if you have uh, a spare time, let's talk about certain topic, uh, whatever the views you can have or yes, whatever, absolutely. that would be very good for uh, the students everywhere. Absolutely. And my point wasn't that I am not an anti-technology person. The reason I say face-to-face -face cannot be replaced by online is, is simply the social aspect of it. Yeah. Part of a college education is not mastering the content in the books and even sitting in a classroom and taking a test. I think part of it is being part of an intellectual community yeah. where you make friends, you meet your professors, you interact with people from other disciplines and that goes a long way into your educational but also into your social growth and that cannot be replaced by internet that cannot be done through internet teaching but given the scenario that we are in i am absolutely delighted that we have these opportunities to directly teach online to our students and to record our lectures which they can use you know, whenever they want. But absolutely, I would love to do a conversation in which we talk about a specific topic for your class and they can watch us have the conversation. But this has been great. I am so delighted to know that you're doing well and that your students are doing well. Uh, Dr. Raja, uh, you, you are quite experienced teacher and uh, you have visited many countries as well. And in that way, your interaction with the students from different communities, from different nations is much larger than any other person in Pakistan. Uh, I, I would uh, request you to give a little type of advice uh, to, to the teachers in Pakistan, how best they can make use of their time in order to facilitate their students. I mean, if you have any idea in your mind, well, I have many ideas, but I mean, my idea is it applies to anyone in any profession, but for teachers, uh, I would say like, you know, decide what you want to be. Do you want to be someone who delivers content yeah. and then marks it for good or bad? Or do you want to be someone who encourages your students to think critically, right? To learn whatever is in a text, but know that you know, meaning doesn't just reside in the text. And then be compassionate, be generous with your time. Teaching is a noble vocation, right? Yeah. In all traditions, but especially in the Islamic tradition, right? Uh, don't be literalist and don't be bureaucratic. You know, don't tell your students, you know, this is what you can do and this is what you cannot do. No, I think teaching should be performed with a certain kind of generosity and humility, right? And we should not be afraid to learn from our students, right? Because sometimes the questions that they ask teach us something new about ourselves, about our subject matter. But more importantly, 
understand the context within which your students are working. Not everyone has the same conditions. Not everyone has the same uh, access to technology, time, right? So treat them as fellow human beings, right? And for each particular student, then you can have a very honed and compassionate and generous response. And those are the kind of teachers we grew up with, we admire even now, right? And, you know, and we encounter them every single day in our lives. And then there are those, you know, who are just there, not necessarily teaching the values that they would want to see in people themselves, right? So that's all I have to say. I think anyone can learn content and deliver it, right? In this internet age, all you have to do is read a book or go to Wikipedia, right? But I think the way we deliver it, the way we have a conversation with our students, and the way we enter that field, right, with, with a certain degree of humility, mm -hmm. I, that's what I would recommend. Thank you very much, Dr. Raja. And uh, I always see uh, your beautiful plants and uh, cats and the chickens and the hens. <laughs> and it makes me uh, remind as if half of Pakistan lives in your home. Uh, the kind of, uh, you know, the things you do there, you are a very dexterous type of person. I should say I'm a dexterous person. I mean, uh, planting and, and then making bats for that and then chickens. How you, how you do all these things all together? I mean, is it possible for a professor to do all these things? Absolutely. The <laughs> yeah, I mean, you just have to figure out what's important in life, right? Mm. So you give your students your full attention. You write your books and scholarship. But then you have to have things that you do with your loved ones, with, with your family, things for yourself that sustain you, right? Um, no one can constantly work intellectually 24 hours a day. So I have a very simple routine, right? I come to my office when it is open, right? When we are not in the lockdown. I'm in my office at 9 o'clock, right? I write till 12, 12.30 if I can. And then I prepare for my classes. I teach my classes. And when I go home, I'm done. Right? By 12 o'clock, I'm done with my research work, my writing, reading, whatever. And I don't write at home. right? So then when I'm at home, I'm doing my hobbies. I'm helping my wife, you know, making she's the one who does most of the food and everything. But, you know, being useful and planting my garden, and that's what sustains you. You have to have something positive to right. pour yourself in. I mean, work is that, and writing excites me, and reading is great, but also things. So I think you, if you have a habit of doing things in a planned kind of way, you can find a lot of time. But to our advantage, we don't have children, right? So if you don't have to take care of kids, you already have more time than parents who have to, you know, take care of their children. I'm not saying that that's a good thing and everyone should not have children. But I think what gives us more time is not having that responsibility. So, okay, thank you so much. And uh, whenever you are ready, we can do a conversation about any of your classes or any of the topics that you're discussing and we can both be on the screen and share our time with your students. That's but nice. Uh, very nice of you, Dr. Raja. And uh, I would request you to say my hello to Jenny as well. Uh, uh, I, I really uh, uh, miss the time when I was able to contact with you people. And hopefully, uh, very soon, such times will return. Absolutely. But so, far, so far, online hellos. Yeah, <laughs> but we would love to have you here. OK. Well, thank, thank you. you so much. and. You have a wonderful day, Thank and so we'll meet much. soon again and talk about some other aspects sure. of education. Sure. So thank you so much. This was Dr. Zia, and we just had a brief conversation about uh, teaching online during this pandemic. So thank you so much, Dr. Zia, and I'll see you next time. Okay. Thank you for having me. So thank you all for joining me. I'm really grateful to Dr. Zia. Uh, for sharing his thoughts with us and for his continuous work for the benefit of his students in Pakistan 
and you can all uh, watch his videos on different aspects of post-colonial studies, Pakistani fiction on his channel, which is named after him, Dr. Zia Ahmed, but I'll also post a link in the description. So please do watch his lectures and subscribe and comment. And I will be back next time with some other conversation with him or with another lecture. And until then, thank you so much. And please also try to subscribe to this channel as well. And stay safe in this terrible situation and take care of each other. And thank you so much for joining me. Until then, until next time, peace and love.